Hi, I'm Dr. Matthew Davids from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School in Boston. I'm also the co-chair of the Medical Advisory Board for the CLL Society. Hi, I'm Bill Werda from the MD Anderson Cancer Center, and I direct the CLL program at MD Anderson. Well, it's great to be here with you today, Bill, to discuss uh, this abstract on longer-term follow-up with acalabrutinib, a, a more selective BTK inhibitor than ibrutinib. And you know, we saw a lot of data at the ASH meeting with combinations of various drugs. Uh, but we now have these long-term data with continuous BTK inhibitor monotherapy that also look very good. And I think as a field, we, we don't know quite yet sort of exactly which approach is better for, for which type of patient. That's one of the things we're, we're trying to work out. But in the meantime, it's very helpful to have these longer-term data with, with single-agent continuous BTK inhibitors. So maybe you could start out with this acalabrutinib abstract. Just describe sort of what the study design was. Sure. So the acalabrutinib uh, abstract was uh, an update from a phase one, two trial with acalabrutinib monotherapy in previously untreated patients. Uh, there were 99 previously untreated patients enrolled on that study and reported on um, at, at ASH. All of those patients were previously untreated at enrollment and received acalabrutinib monotherapy. Um, for treatment of their CLL. They were not necessarily selected for any other particular features such as 17P deletion or by their mutation status. It was sort of an all-comer frontline uh, clinical trial for untreated uh, patients. And as you mentioned, the report for ASH this year is the longer term follow-up from the results from that trial. That trial has been reported previously, it's been published on. But what we like to see now these days is the longer term follow up um, for these uh, BTK inhibitors, ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, xanabrutinib, for, for, for an idea of what the long term effects are and also for how long patients respond and how they do if they progress. Great. So pretty straightforward design. These patients are just starting on the single drug. Uh, most of them were taking it twice a day. I think there was a small group that started it once a day. Uh, and then they continued on it basically until uh, the disease got worse again or they're having side effects. So in terms of the results, let's, let's break it down in terms of what we would call efficacy and safety. So from the efficacy standpoint, how effective was this drug? So the drug is extremely effective. As you mentioned, it's the standard dose for acalabrutinib is 100 milligrams twice a day. Some of, a few of the patients receive 200 milligrams once a day. My preference is for twice a day dosing for, for these agents. Um, and in this case, 100 milligrams twice a day. Um, and uh, in terms of efficacy, Things that we look at is the response rate to treatment, that is how many patients achieved the criteria that we have for either a complete remission or partial remission. 97% of the patients achieved either a partial remission or a complete remission. We know historically from work with ibrutinib, most of these patients will have reduction in the bulk of their disease who are being treated with a BTK inhibitor like ibrutinib or acalabrutinib but most of them don't achieve a complete remission uh, like we have seen with chemoimmunotherapy where the level of disease is um, decreased um, to, the, to, to the level and criteria of achieving a, a complete remission, which requires normal blood counts, a normal lymphocyte count in the blood, normal lymphocyte count in the bone marrow and recovery of, um, and uh, also reduction of all the lymph nodes less than 1.5 centimeters. Um, so 9% of the patients achieved complete remission, 88% or most of the patients achieved the partial remission. The criteria for partial remission is in general a 50% reduction in the bulk of the disease. We see uh, the time to responding to be very quick. So on average, the, the um, time to response to treatment was about four months. Uh, and the duration of response is extremely good. Um, and the progression-free survival has been extremely good. So when we think about the duration of response or progression-free survival, we think about the average time 
that the drug is effective at maintaining the response or maintaining patients progression free. The average time has not yet been reached with this follow-up, uh, which is about uh, six year uh, uh, follow-up for, for the trial. Um, and that's not surprising. We know from ibrutinib, for example, the updated data for ibrutinib, the median progression-free survival has not been reported for the Resonate trial with a seven-year follow-up. So we don't know the duration of the average duration um, uh, of uh, response or the median uh, response duration um, or progression-free survival. What we do know at about six years, um, uh, the, dura the, duration, the rate of uh, um, duration of response is about 90%. Uh, so that means about 90% or 89% of the patients at 66 months are still responding to continued treatment. For progression-free survival, uh, at six years, the rate is 87%. So that means about 80%, 87% of the patients are still responding to treatment um, uh, at that time point. So highly effective. Um, it does require continuous treatment and treat till treat till progression. So these patients are all on a maintenance therapy. Pretty remarkable though. 87% of patients are still progression-free at six years just by taking this one pill uh, twice a day. So uh, great efficacy results. Now, what about on the safety side? What was the toxicity profile like? Safety, we talk about the, the in-class or um, class-specific uh, toxicities and side effects with these drugs. Um, so just to make a few comments about BTK inhibitors and particularly with regard to, to acalabrutinib, um, these drugs do have a risk of atrial fibrillation. Um, it's a relatively low incidence. Uh, it's a cumulative effect. So the longer patients um, are taking the drug, the higher the, the cumulative incidence of atrial fibrillation uh, will be reported. So if we have a trial where patients have been on, um, on treatment for uh, six years um, or so, um, we will see a higher rate of atrial fibrillation compared to if the follow-up is three years. Um, and different trials have reported different incidences because the, the follow-up is, is different, the patient population is different, and there are features for atrial fibrillation in particular that do correlate with a higher risk of developing cardiac toxicity and complications like atrial fibrillation. Patients who have a pre-existing uh, cardiac disease or pre-existing atrial fibrillation are at higher risk. In general, um, the incidence of, uh, of atrial fibrillation is relatively low uh, overall. Um, and on this trial, uh, I don't recall the specific number that we reported for atrial fibrillation, but I believe it was less than 6%. Yeah, I think it was right around 6%. I have it up in front of me, yeah. Okay. It's pretty low, yeah. Percent. Um, that's lower than what we would expect for ibrutinib based on our experience with ibrutinib in a similar setting of long term treatment. Um, and, and so, but it is a risk for this category of uh, patients. Bleeding, because the drugs, these drugs, and inhibition of BTK uh, does inhibit platelet function. Uh, there is an increased risk for bleeding and bruising, so that has been reported. Um, patients uh, can develop headache with acalabrutinib, which is um, not necessarily seen for the other BTK inhibitors and is a low-grade headache and is usually um, only lasts for about a month. Um, and upwards of 50% of the patients can experience a headache, which is transient and will, will go away. Um, those, are the main, that, those are the main side effects and, and toxicities. I think in general, patients with CLL, because their immune function is not normal, will have a baseline incidence of infections, pneumonias, and also second cancers. So those have been reported on this trial and, and on other trials. I wouldn't necessarily say that's a side effect from the treatment, but more a, a side effect or complication that we see with the disease. Right, that makes sense. So it sounds like both from an efficacy standpoint and a safety standpoint, uh, this drug was, was effective and, and well tolerated and can be a great option for patients uh, who, who wanna be on a continuous therapy and, and have a long remission. Um, so any, any final thoughts on, on this abstract? No, I think the, the, the follow-up um, 
is a, a reasonably long follow-up. We don't have an appreciation across all of the irreversible inhibitors of BTK in the frontline setting, what the median progression-free survival or duration of response is, which is a good thing because that means it's excellent and it's many years. Um, and however, it does, uh, as I mentioned, require continuous treatment and, and maintenance. And with that comes a risk for side effects and toxicities long-term. Great, well, thanks so much, Bill, for summarizing that data so nicely. Uh, and we look forward to seeing further updates with ACAL-Britinib in the future. Great, thank you.